Greetings from Denver. This is Greg Aiden of Aiden Leadership and another episode of Your Servant Leader. And today I have two wonderful people on, on our show. And first of all, I'll introduce to you Kevin Scholl is coming to us live from Columbus, Ohio. Correct. All right. See, I said that with a question mark because I wasn't exactly sure. And a Abigail Manning is coming to us live from Denver. I don't know what particular area of Denver she lives in, but we're going to find out all about both of them here in a minute. So let's start with you, Kevin, because you're the one that's uh, decided to wear a bow tie on a podcast. I love that. And before you go into who you are and what you do, I'd love for you to, to, to describe for the, the people watching us what in the world is behind you and, and why is that important? So I'm a marketing guy, first and foremost. So that yeah. explains the environment that I put myself in. So when uh, I realized that I was going to be home-based in an office, the first decision that I made was I need to surround myself with things that inspire me and that mm. remind me of my core reason for sitting here eight to 10 hours a day, which is to tell a story. And yeah. I'm telling the story of a brand um, that's been around since 1943. So I have a foundation of what that story is, but I want, I still want to be able to put my own little spin on it. And the around me reminds me of what, you can do when you take an idea that somebody already created, but put your own little spin on it. Because these are all interpretations yeah. uh, done in the last couple of years of movie posters and, and movie property from you know, the 70s and the 80s. And not only that, it's all hand drawn. And as awesome. a digital guy, I don't want to lose sight of the organic nature of storytelling and the yeah. technology can't rule story. So these are all, this, it's a reminder for me of, of what, what I do every day and, and kind of how I choose to approach what I do. When you tell a story, do you start with a hand-drawn picture? Are you, a, are you an artist in that way as well? Can you illustrate to, to make your point? Uh, I can't draw to save my life, which is why I went into technology. <laughs> Good. I was just curious. Yeah, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a very visual person, so I see it all in my head, and then... I luckily get to interpret that vision um, instead of drawing it on a napkin. I bring up Photoshop and, and use digital tools that allow for those of us who may not be blessed with a, a, an organic ability to translate their vision to paper. I can do it pretty well with the technology that we have at our, our toolbox these days. Terrific. I'm going to come back to you in a second and, and get the, the, the what you do and who you're doing it for. We need to give Radisson some, some airtime as well. But be thinking about why you do what you do. So, Abigail, over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and, and what do you do? And start to tell us a little bit about why you chose to do what you do. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to have the chat today with both of you and sharing it with your audience. I appreciate it, Greg. You bet. Yeah, so as you said, I'm in Denver. I'm in Colorado. I love Colorado all the time, except for <laughs> April and May, because yeah. we're still getting hammered with snow. <laughs> so um, that's where I live. But I love that I get to work all around the world. Um, I've been working in Italy. Uh, I have a client, again, a repeat client tomorrow in Washington. Um, and thankfully, with COVID, one of the positive things, we're always trying to look for the positive outcomes that we can sure. find from things and take away with all of the Zoom technology and things like that, um, we've been able to do everything remotely. Uh, sadly, I wanted to be able to have my passport out and be able to go to these wonderful locations, but that's coming in the near future. Um, and I'm lucky that I get to work and pass my curriculum that I developed uh, about how to be our best selves. Really, it's kind of you one, want one word, it might be self-mastery um, mm. for yourself and leadership and culture. Um, but I've been able to do it through the military. I speak a lot with uh, different branches, especially the Air Force um, and corporations. I'm working here in Colorado with some corporations. And uh, I just, I feel very blessed to be able to do what I do. And I took what I, the reason why I do it is I overcame a lot of adversity um, and people who look anything in my website or information will know right away I came through childhood abuse by both my parents and domestic violence and the pit of PTS um, and I don't want that for anybody else and so I can help people recognize what are the warning signs of unhealthy behavior limiting personal thoughts how do we remove those and then rewire sure. them so we can be healthy and thriving I don't have a very interesting background because I change it quite a bit and I use whiteboards where I I can't draw like Kevin I'm, I'm like 
piece out. I'm not good at that, but mm. I definitely throw posters. I was working with the Wounded Warrior Projects, um, a group of female alumni. And so I had a huge Wonder Woman poster back there yeah. for that event. Um, but that's a little bit about who I am, where I am, and why I do what I do. Well, while we're still on your why, tell us about the your two most important followers and a little bit about their journey. And and uh, I've not met them. I've just heard a lot about them. And I, and I believe it'd be nice for the audience to know uh, a, a little bit about them. So introduce your, your followers, your two. My, my two, my one and two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think you're referring to my kids, hopefully, and uh, not just you and Kevin, right? <laughs> right. No, well, he's, he's definitely a follower and I'm a follower too. So I'll be, I'll be number two, but yes, you're four. I've yeah. got four now. Well, I think you have thousands, but you're being modest. Well, but, um, well, thank you. My pride and joy. I raised my children from the time they were five and two by myself. I was a solo parent and, mm -hmm. um, my daughter is, uh, she just rotated out and retired. She's Marine. Um, and she was HMX one, which is presidential helicopter squadron. She's one there of those kids that took a lot of hardship, you know, abandonment and hurt and anger and being bullied at school. And she used that for the good, you know, like we uh, believe strongly in protecting other people, speaking up for other people who do, can't do it quite yet, role modeling that. So she stormed off to boot camp and took first place at boot camp and all this other remarkable stuff and used that anger as her fuel to move forward and help sure. others. Um, so she's done really well. She's a horsewoman. She has two fabulous horses. Uh, if that wasn't enough of a challenge, she got a wild Mustang because she went to learn how to gentle a wild Mustang and talk about leadership skills, man. Wow. She learned a ton in communication and advanced communication. And then my son is also a Marine and he's Intel. Um, and he overcame severe dyslexia. And there's a whole story behind the work and the family and the commitment and believe in people, just pour it on them, how much you believe in them, because yeah. you really can overcome huge obstacles. And those can be the fuel that help you move forward in life um, and go after something that's audaciously big, because you might surprise yourself. <laughs> At yeah. least I have myself, you know, and my kids are um, my pride and joy for sure. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to talk more about them, and we'll give them names later in the show. But I want to bring them up when it comes to servant leadership too, and what a what a great example they are. Mr. Uh, Kevin, now share with us exactly what you do and for who, and and, and dig it dig a little bit deeper into the the why you've chosen not only this company but your your continued passion of of doing what you do. So I am the franchise marketing manager for Radisson Hotel Group Americas. So we are a hospitality brand. Uh, I'm sure most of, uh, hopefully everybody's heard of Radisson Hotels. Uh, what I do for them is I came on board to Radisson uh, to help their development team tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, and when I've been in hospitality space for about 15 years, um, it was one of those, the, the why I got into it was that, uh, you know, I was the stereotypical introverted geek as a kid, as you can probably tell from my background. I still retain a little bit of that. Um, <clears throat> I got into the idea of wanting to be a storyteller, and I discovered uh, film school. And the thing that film school taught me was that I can't be an introverted storyteller if I want to see my, you know, these things come to life. You have to have a collaborative group of people sure. all working together with different skill sets to come up with the single vision of what your story is going to be and marketing was my plan b and i got into marketing because nobody makes a living unfortunately in the film industry in terms of just making a living i'm not talking about even becoming famous so sure. i had a good mentor who, who kind of talked me into the reality of if you want to proceed in, in life and have the things here's what you should do marketing when i got into it was still very much a traditional marketing environment that was kind of the brand telling the consumer what the mm -hmm. story was, and then they moved on to the next thing. But as it evolved, and certainly with the advent of digital consumerism, this idea of, of creating content that's engaging, and more importantly, really working with the consumer, your guest, to be a part of the story, that's what fascinated mm -hmm. me. Um, I shifted into hospitality because as a marketing person, it was an opportunity to have a product that has an emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I respect the people who can who can market widgets and and, and who can market uh, medicines and things. But for me, to be able to tell the story well, I have to be passionate about whatever the product is. And I love to travel. 
I love the idea of experience and getting into the hospitality industry was one that allowed me to, uh, as a professional, have some part to play in somebody's life experience. One of the reasons I came to Radisson is because Radisson has a strong philosophy on building, you know, relationships are what drive the brand and being able to come in and help them figure out how do we evolve how we tell our brand story as developers. Right. How do we tell our story to our clients? How do we tell our story to potential clients? Um, so that is what I get to do. It's, it's a, the core of telling the hotel story. It's just a different perspective and a different audience. So I'm not, it's not the lifestyle marketing that I you know, have right. done in the past. It's the getting a potential hotelier to say, why do I want to be a part of the Radisson brand? Mm -hmm. What's that story? I get to help the, you know, working with a team with people at uh, my brand tell that story. Yeah. I, many people watching this know that uh, for 30 years I was in hospitality, eight years with Marriott. But what most people remember me by was the 16 and a half years I was with IHG. And as a franchise director, I sold franchises and very important people like yourself were in brands who thought they were telling a story, but they were really just reminding people of the legacy of the brand. And as a franchise director, the people you're responsible to report to, we wanted the brand people to tell a story. So for someone to have the, the background and the intellect to tell a story to a prospective customer, God bless you. I wish I would have had one of you at IHG because I was always saying, I need tools. I need to be able to tell, tell a story. Let's talk leadership. Yeah, let's talk leadership. Uh, Abigail, when did you decide to help people get better? And when did you decide to really lean into leaders and help them become better men and women first and then help them become better leaders? I pretend that's part of what you do, yeah? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I'm the founder of Create Awareness, Change Lives. And the key for me is to create the awareness. And what mm -hmm. I loved about what Kevin was sharing is storytelling. So through our authentic stories, like so five years ago, I never told anybody, Greg, that I had been through any form of abuse. That was a secret that I kept mm -hmm. all the shame, the blame, the judgment and, and things like that, right? And what I learned is that we live small when that happens. And so what I try to do is help everybody be bigger and live bigger. Yeah. And a lot of it is like Kevin said, through storytelling. So um, when people come to me, organizations come to me um, recently, I was very honored to be a, an instructor down at USAFA, the United States Air Force Academy, because they said, when I think of you, I think of grit. I think of resilience. I think mm -hmm. of fortitude. Can you talk on that? I'm like, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, and I've got some stories. Spot. <laughs> and, and then what happens is you build these stories and then you weave in, you know, I have the double major in cognitive, social and behavioral studies. So there's theory behind it and in, you know, emotional intelligence and all that, but no one wants to be lectured to, right? And through the storytelling, if I sent it with an authentic tone, it allows them to do the same. If I shine, it allows them to have the shine too. If I tell a story of trauma or hardship or, uh, an overt difficult obstacle to overcome. And I don't have to sit there and be like this victim because I don't see myself as a victim, mm -hmm. right? Then I give them the ability to look at square in the face and then lead from that position, grow from it, lead from it. And what happens is then they develop it even for leadership in particular, they develop this even deeper level of understanding and empathy for other people. Mm -hmm. So part of the self-mastery curriculum I've put together is my own content called Purple Threads. And at the bottom of that, the root of that, it's limiting personal thoughts. At the bottom of that, you walk out and realize we all have it. Yeah. I don't care your title. I don't care. Yeah, right. I don't care where you are in your career, how old you are, what position you have. We all have purple threads. And so if we're in conflict with one another, I can take a step back. I can implement some of the tools out of that toolbox you probably had, you know, mm -hmm. deep breathing or, you know, getting the parasympathetic system back on board, calming ourselves down so we can respond appropriately with positive behavior versus a negative you know, reaction to something. Um, and then I can go, you know, Greg has a story. Kevin has a story. There might be something I'm missing here. Well, you and I, you and I share similar uh, desires to go out and help other people be better human beings, better men, better women, and certainly better leaders. And I would say that the, the connection that I have been able to make similar to yourself, Abigail, is when I uh, have empathy and I can relate 
but I want them to relate to me so I share my vulnerabilities. I share my story. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to like it. I just help that this will open up some avenues for you and I to discuss things at a deeper level. And you said the word authentic. There's nothing more important than being real and authentic, first with ourselves, and then we can be real with other people. And until you decided what it is you wanted to do or what you wanted to conquer, let go of, understand, become aware of, et cetera, and accept, I don't believe you could have done any of the work you've just mentioned if, unless you would have done your own work, yeah? Yes, true, 100%. And, and what the, the work you're doing out there is so needed, and I, uh, we've already talked about it, but I'm, I'm hoping you, you're, sh you're saving a space for February 4th, 2022, as we do another Leadership Development Day, because what the world <laughs> needs now and will need next year is how do we truly, authentically become better people because we want to, and we want to inspire others by our words, our behavior, and our relationships. Not because we tell people to, but because we, in, we invite them to. So, so, so excited to share the stage with you next year. Thank you. I'm honored. I'm looking forward to it. It's in my calendar. Good. Kevin, tell us your experiences with leadership. And from your standpoint, I'd love to hear your, your view of what's good or great leadership, according to Kevin Scholl. And what are some leaders and leadership you've been around that didn't work so well and don't need to name any names unless you on the positive side you want to bring somebody up uh, but free license to talk about leadership according to Kevin Scholl ladies and gentlemen Kevin Scholl so I think you know my idea of leadership uh, comes from discovery at an early age of, of what a film director did mm. and you know when you when I when I was on a film set and I recognized that you had a singular person that everybody was looking to, uh, to drive, you know, the end result. Interesting. And you had two types. You had the tyrant who said, you know, this is my vision and you're here to facilitate what I need. And then you had the collaborative who said, we're all here together. I don't have the skill sets that you have, that you have, that you have. I have the general direction and idea of where we need to go. So I can leave that and, you know, naturally, and because I have this title, I will do that, but we're doing it together. And so when it came into my career path to be able to figure out what type of leader that I, I want to be, I always held to the, what I loved about the nature of professionalism was the collaboration. Yeah. And I set goals for myself that said, I, I'm not chasing after a title in my professional path because that's not what's going to satisfy me. Right. What satisfies me is the work and being able Amen. to differentiate the two is what, where, when I was fortunate enough to start having people under my leadership professionally, my take on it was to be the leader who said, from day one, you matter. My title happens to be something that I write in an email or they put on the door, Yep. but that's all it means. Um, you know, I am here to, because I, I do have experience and I'm going to share that experience, but I'm also here because I need to learn. And I, I knew bringing new people who may be less senior is, yeah. is the best opportunity for me to learn. So I always focused on the collaborative nature of at the end of the day, I'm here to, I'm serving the, the, the brand or the product. Mm -hmm. My role within that needs to be labeled because we have a hierarchy that needs to, to make business work sure. but i always approached it from a, uh, this idea of i serve the brand i serve the story and then i surround myself with people who can help me facilitate that i want to lead the to help tell the story for everyone mm -hmm. for our guests for our franchisees for our mm -hmm. internal teams i have to understand how can I contribute as a part of the team, but what yeah. are the areas of opportunity that I may have that I can bring to the table and say, Hey, you know, I let me pick this one up and run with it, but I'm going to allow everybody the opportunity to be a part of it. So to me, that's the best leader, the best, you know, I, I always led, you know, the, the thing that anybody who's worked for me over the last 25 years will say, give me a Kevin Scholl quote. The quote is, I don't care if you fail as long as you fail with good intention. Yeah, make, an, make, a, make a realistic effort. Yeah, you know, that, yeah. 
you know, it, as, especially with, you know, that I've been fortunate to be able to work with kids by those schools is their first job. You know, I take that responsibility seriously, uh, not only for the fact that, you know, the only way for any brand or uh, organization to succeed is that everybody's firing at, at their best. And you have to inspire them, whether it's their first day or they've been there for 20 years to continue to have that level of passion. Well, I would say, again, I'm a, I'm a big word person. I would say you don't have to. Leaders, we get to. We get to inspire people by our words, by our actions, and by our relationships. And it's not a burden. As I said at Leadership Development Day on February 4th, leaders, if you're listening, if it feels like a burden for you to lead, stop. Go find something else. Because whether you're right out of school or whether this is your fourth job, you said it, not me. Collaborative leadership is much better than competitive or do-it-my-way leadership. And by the way, at home, how are you parenting? But the other thing you said was ins inspire. And John Maxwell and many others would tell you that it's not our job to do it. It's our, inspire, it's our job to inspire others to do it with, with our direction. And I, can so, I could so see you directing a film. And I'm certainly, uh, I bet you $1,000, and at some point, you're going to have a film director type position with some other company, maybe in the hospitality, where you're behind the camera collaborating with a lot of other people to tell the story. Before we get off Radisson, I, I go ahead and mention, who do you report to and why did you decide to follow this human being over to Radisson? Because Phil and I are very close and you know I, I served he and his team for three years. So let's give him a name and a title. So Phil Hugh is our chief director. Uh, development officer and it was really his vision to bring me and yep. by me I mean my position to yep. Radisson um, so I was fortunate enough that when the position was created and Phil you know Phil and I had worked in the past and we had that same kind of vision for uh, you know the hospitality industry in, in my 100% personal opinion didn't focus a lot of attention on the story outside of consumer. Right. So I was lucky to have some great conversations with Phil in our previous roles. And when he came into uh, Radisson, it, you know, he called me and said, hey, what would you think about this opportunity? Um, and I looked at Radisson. I've known, obviously, in the hospitality industry, I've known mm -hmm. Radisson. So that for me, it was the opportunity to be able to say, I, at my last role, I was there for a good enough time where I felt that I, I, I did that inspired leadership. I built a great team of, of of young marketers who are still there doing great things or have moved on to do other things. It was a challenge for me to say, what can I do for Radisson? Well, well let me interrupt you. The, I, I can tell you, I can remind you why you're on this show and I know why you aren't there anymore. And the truth is you did not have leadership that was inspirational. You did not have leadership that was true leadership. We don't need to mention the company because it's not an issue, but what you did find is someone that understood you and what you wanted to do and your passion for telling a story. Two, two messages, and we're going to go to Abigail, is you look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, whether you're 28, 38, 48, or 58, and say, am I happy? And if you're not, own it. Do something else, because no one's coming. No, nobody, even a great leader, don't knock on your door every day and say, Kevin, how can we make you more comfortable today? No, they, they, you, you have to do that for yourself. You have to own your stuff. And secondly, leaders, if you're listening, it's not about you. It's about you to be a great leader, but you become a great leader because others say you are. And by the way, you mentioned it, and I'll just put a nail in the coffin, so to speak. A title, unless you're a lieutenant, a captain, or a sergeant, or some other... Uh, uh, Armed Forces sort of title, Abigail, you're, I hope you agree, our titles will never be on our tombstone. And, and how great you were as a film director will probably never be on your tombstone. But what you did for others, how you showed up for spouse, partner, children, family, probably will. It, it, I mean, yes, it'll have your name and your date, but what you did, mm, what your title was, no, but how you showed up for others, big opportunity for it to show up there. You opened a big door, and one that I love, it's one of my favorite topics, is servant leadership. Because I studied leadership while I was still with IHG, ex 
excessively. And what I found out was there's really one type of leadership to me that makes it all worthwhile, and that's to serve someone first and then lead them. So, Abigail, take that away and, and take us, what does your, what does your heart say relative to servant leadership and where do you see it in your work? And then be bold and, and, and tell the audience, what does this world need today relative to servant leadership? Love it. Love it. Well, I want to tie it back in because I've been, this is, I love listening to both of you. It's wonderful. It's like my head is zinging. So I've taken some notes and um, Kevin, when you were talking about servant leadership to start, you talk about safe creating safe, like a safe environment, uh, you know, psychological safety in the workplace is a thing that we weren't talking about earlier, right? And so I love that you brought that up about being safe. And what is the intention? Is the intention behind it good? Because it's quick to be defensive. It's quick to be combative. It's quick to think the person, like you said, Greg, it's not about you, right? So if you think it's about you, then you think the world is an attack against you. And, right. you know, or they, they meant to slide me and not give me um, credit during that meeting or something. But what is the intent behind behind it. Um, and I think for me, the most powerful, I, I agree with both of you guys about servant leadership. I also have a tougher, I'm, I'm a little bit of tough love kind of person. So when Greg, you were talking mm -hmm. about teaching your kids how to do their, their bedroom, I, I did. Yeah. I, you know, I was running a company. I ran a, a home on acreage and I had two kids and I was at all their activities and events. So, okay, guys, here's the intent. Here's what we need. Your bedrooms need to be cleaned up. Here's the timeline in which it needs to be done. You guys attack it. If you're overwhelmed or something, come talk to me about it. What are the ways you're going to do it? So then, then as a leader, as a parent, I was able to say, here's what I expect. This is what we can do. This is where we're going to drive forward. This is yeah. the goal. Now, how do you think you're going to do it? So, you know, what are the steps you're going to take? What is the timeline? If we have to leave for your track meet, you know, by such and such time, how long do you think this project is going to take? You're teaching all of these skills, but most importantly to me, you're teaching the kids to believe in themselves, yep. to understand that I can figure this out. You know, instead of saying I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm lazy, or any of those other negative purple threads, the personal limiting thoughts that we have, we can start wiring in positive personal thoughts, positive beliefs about ourselves. And so for me, the servant leadership has to be married with a tough love leadership. Like I expect you to do your best. Mm -hmm. I, and when you fail and you will, because we all do, that's part of the learning curve. That's so cool. What yeah. did you learn from that? How did you grow from it? And the thing you said, Greg, that I'm smiling so big about when you said it was own it. Mm. Absolutely. That's what purple threads are. It's all about power and control. And if you don't own your own power and control, you don't own your own internal dialogue. That means you become a marionette string connected to whoever else. And that does want the power and control. Amen. So if you don't have a servant leadership, you have a dictator leadership, you have a manipulative person, you have a difficult colleague, you have an abusive relationship, marriage or something, then you become their power and control gadget that they get to play with. And that's no one wins then. That's not a successful world. So mm -hmm. for me, it is own it. And the reason why I also, one of the reasons I call them purple threads is purple is stands for courage. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of courage to look deep within to see what is this connected to? Why am I feeling this way? It's easy to blame other people. It's easy to blame a boss. It's easy to blame a spouse. It's easy to blame a child for whatever reason, not cleaning up the room fast enough using that analogy, but to actually own it 24 seven, to me, that is the ultimate of self mastery and hopefully the best of leadership. Well, imagine, imagine if our children grew up with, my, my principles are, are, most people know them already, but it's integrity. I am, I am my word, accountability, responsible for all, our thoughts, our words, and our actions, courage, humility, and passion. And I see that most leaders, uh, honestly, they struggle, they all believe they're integral, don't question my integrity. I'm very good at holding other people accountable, not myself, but that's not what I, that's not what they interpret accountability to mean at times, but they struggle with courage, not me having the courage to tell other people what to do, but the courage to have real conversations with real people about real issues. Now, they can point to and say, make your, make your bed and because I said so. But what I loved about what you said, Abigail, is you said, you ask your kids, what are you going to do in order to be on time? What do, do you need to do to make sure the room gets cleaned up? You didn't say, let mommy help you so we can get out of here quickly. That, that's not creating accountability. And it certainly doesn't create courage in case they do forget to do something, you can check it 
later and say, hey, what happened here? I, I uh, well, they're either going to make something up or they're going to say exactly what's truth. And to be honest, what I'm struggling with with one of my kids is I ask him something and then I get the look over here or look over there thing and I go, okay, this is the time where I count to about three or four and give him some space to muster the courage to tell me the truth because it's got to be real or it's not going to be right. And that's what I tell my, my son all the time. And the other one's so full of courage, he, he can bust through a wall. So it's interesting, the, the dynamic I have at home. Well, I love it when they have all those adjectives that you gave, and courage and intent and honor and integrity and everything. And so for to me, one, one was cleaning the toilet. I'll show you three times. You can take notes. You can ask any questions. But be proud of the work you do. I don't care if you're cleaning a toilet. Yeah, I don't care if you're the it. president of a company and I taught them to own it themselves, yeah. to own if it was done, to inspect their own work, to double check their list, to think, you know, how would I look at this? Like my boss would look at it. And, um, they actually both thought Marine boot camp was pretty easy relatively. I'm saying relatively sure. because they knew you listen to what's being told and, and then do it and do it to the best of your ability. And you will fall and fail because that's their goal. They're going to break you so they can rebuild you, right? When you know yep. you've been to your breaking point and you can come out of it even stronger, man, you're amazing. And um, that's some of the skill sets they learned. And they said it was easier because we just knew, mom, we knew it was our responsibility to do the best we could or the best intent, as Kevin said. And um, when you do that, then you let the chips fall where they're going to fall. You, you, this might be a softball for, for both of you, but I, I want you to quickly and efficiently answer this question. What do you believe the leader's number one role is in an organization? And then connect it to what your belief is. What's the number one role of a parent? They may be the same. They may be similar, but I'd love your opinion. First to you, Kevin, what do you believe the number one role of a leader is? And then what do you believe the number one role of a parent is? Uh, for number one role of a leader within a brand should be to make sure that everyone who is involved within that brand is, feels connected. Okay. So that they all feel that they are a part of something. And how about as a parent? What's the number one role of a parent, according to Kevin Scholl? To inspire my child to be better than me. What I mean by that is I don't, I, I want to her to be her own person. I don't want to, I'm not, I didn't have a child to be a replication of something that's already happened. Amen. And I want to her to certainly be great if she's influenced by what I've chosen to do with my life, but I want to set the best example so that she can interpret how she creates her best example. Beautiful. To you, uh, advocate, what's what in, in short, what's your what's your vision of the number one responsibility of a, of a leader? And then uh, that same question for a parent, please. Fabulous. Thank you. I like this question. Um, so for me, for leadership, it would be trust to build trust that people trust you and you build trust among each other. And I'm always a couple mm. levels deep. It's never just the flat surface answer. So sure. to me, trust is more of an acronym and it's building a culture that has truth, respect, unity, safety, and transparency. So T-R-U-S-T needs Amen. all of those different things. Um, and so a culture of trust. And then as a parent, I would say it's for my kid to shine as brightly as my kid can shine with all the gifts they've been given. Don't worry about where your light is dim or it's dark. It's okay. You can shine. And as you started off, Greg, saying about collaboration versus competition, that shine your light on other people. Encourage everybody else around mm. you to shine as well, because it doesn't mean you have less if they have a bright light, right? So to me, own who you are, shine as bright as you can, and encourage other people around you to do the same and only align yourself and date and marry and befriend and be with people who have those same kind of values because you do become like the people you hang around. Amen. So let's wrap this up by saying, in your opinion, COVID or not, what do you believe the world needs right now relative to servant leadership? And if there was one or two takeaways for the people listening, because most people listen to the show with the intent on how I can be a better leader. Two big takeaways, Kevin, you go first. What, what do you want to leave the audience with? Two things they could do to be a better servant leader tomorrow. Uh, number one is that we have to condition ourselves to understand empathy. So empathy. And? 
if you are a if you're working at or if you are a leader who says you're not allowed to walk down the executive hallway because it uh, will disturb <laughs> the, the executive, change that policy. Number one, mm -hmm. if you're working in one of those environments, find a better of an environment that allows you to walk down the executive hallway because that's the only way you are going to learn the things that you need to learn to take us to that next level of where we can be as leaders. Well, you and I both know the advice you gave on, uh, for number two will only be appreciated by people who don't believe there are hallways for executives. But thank you very much. And secondly, Simon Sinek, some of you might have heard of him. He created this, the story of why. And by the way, his example was all about Apple because Apple didn't, didn't sell what they did it or how they did it, but they, why they did it. And I love that. I love that analogy. And everything I do is, it's, I don't say it all starts with why, but I don't really care what you do. I do really am invested in why you're doing it because then I can understand and believe your story. To you, my love, what do you say to the audience around two things that leaders relative to servant leadership should be doing today and tomorrow because of where we are? Well, I'm going to piggyback on your why. So Simon Sinek's work is wonderful. Um, and so the whole why, where does it come from? And I think the reason why I really like it is because then you're trustworthy. So my first would be as a leader, be authentic with yourself, know thyself. Yeah. Um, and then the second part of that would tie into the family oath that we created. It is, um, I will treat others and myself with love, respect, and kindness. Well, I'll tell you a little secret that I, I haven't said on the air before, but as a confident and successful man that was making a boatload of money and the world was telling me that I was number one at what I did and my wall behind me with all the awards, not this wall, but the wall that I used to live in, uh, when I finally pulled my head out of my you-know-what and I got some uh, insight, what I learned is I was as kind of myself as I thought I was. I was arrogant. I knew everything. I was competitive. And if we're going to play, we're going to play to win. But what I learned is I learned that I was worthy of love. So what I remind my kids all the time, and if you come into our house, you'll see be kind on the on the outside of their door so the first thing they see when they go into their room is to be kind but i also let them know that you are worthy of love and you will always have my love so that's the first time i've ever shared that publicly other than on some other things but you guys are both huge inspirations i'm so glad you were on the show today and i'm so glad you got to know one another i know you'll stay in touch and I want you to make a promise to us right now, Kevin, that you, at some point you will direct a small film, a big film, any kind of film. And That's fair. Okay, good. And what's one promise you're going to... Now, I have directed commercials for the brands that I work for. So. Ah, commercials, commercials. I'm talking a film full of leadership and imp inspiration and kindness and empathy and... Yeah, let me know, because I, I think Abigail would be a, a good starring role for you, a good starring person. Oh, come on. You, <laughs> she'd jump at the chance. I, I don't think she's seen a stage she hasn't liked, because it's not because she's on stage, but because she's serving ser serving other people. All I, can, all I can say is thank you both. It, I've, th I've, I've enjoyed myself. I hope you guys did, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Both of you. Kevin, thanks for all you do. Give, give Phil Hugh a big hug for me, would you? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Greg. It was wonderful to have you, Abigail. And to everybody listening, again, this is Greg Aiden with Aiden Leadership. Thank you for putting your time and your faith into our show. And go out and be a better leader. Be a servant leader if you can. Be kind. Be considerate. Have empathy. And ask people, what is it they want from you? And try this one on for size. How may I be a better leader today? How may I be a better parent today? It'll be a, you'll be amazed by the, the answers you get from the simple questions that are not about you. It's about how you could serve someone else. God bless.